that right? Or is that you uh, freeze five minutes, if you will? You have five minutes for opening statements. Please push the button. socially unacceptable for white Americans to give voice to black stereotypes in anger or in jest. By the early 1990s, the term political correctness had been coined to make fun of an exaggerated sensitivity to personal feelings attached to group, mem to group membership. The concept of political correctness is less important for naming a hypocritical repression of speech than for identifying an incomplete transformation. Specifically, the change in public norms has not been accompanied by a change in private attitudes. Political correctness could not exist absent the tension between what is expected and what is believed or felt. For example, large majorities of whites say that blacks should have equal opportunity, but major American cities remain highly segregated. Black children continue to get inferior education and medical care and black unemployment remains twice as high as white. How do whites explain these differences? In the early 1940s, surveys found that majorities of, white, of whites explained lower black achievement as evidence of intellectual in inferiority. Today, only a small minority claim that is true. The shift in perception from innate biological differences to social injustice fueled the civil rights movement. Unfortunately, it also gave whites license to discount discrimination as an explanation for the, for the continuing difference between black and white success. Majorities of whites now believe that the lesser position of African Americans is due to moral failing or flaws in black culture itself. In our own research on the black image in the white mind, whites we interviewed spontaneously referred to media images of sexuality and violence that supported their negative views. These images substituted for the absence of sustained contact between whites and blacks, inevitable in a society that remains segregated. This is especially true among those persons whom we call the ambivalent majority, those whites who are sympathetic to aspirations of black Af Americans, but who are influenced by images that highlight irresponsibility and violence. In short, majorities of white Americans have good intentions, but not the settled inner convictions to put their ideals into practice, perhaps because the forms of discrimination routinely experienced by African Americans have become less visible. Social psychologists who study social cognition, how people see and process the social world, explain this ambivalence by invoking the premise that we need simplified mental representations, they call them schemata, to deal with reality. Schemata are simple, are simple mental shortcuts that, that let us economize in brain power they also distort our perceptions. So powerful are these mental pictures that they may be activated without conscious control or awareness, a phenomenon widely reported by research in a broad range of contexts. For example, whites take less time to associate traits such as intelligence and kindness for a white face than for a black face because those traits are consistent with their mental representations of whites. These experimental results have important real-world implications. In one study, researchers sent resumes, identical resumes, except for stereotypically white or black names to employers in Chicago and Boston, and found that Greg and Emily were 50% more likely to get callbacks than Jamal and Lakeisha. In another, experimenters gave an identical test to black and white college students. In one condition, students were told the test would assess intelligence, 
and the other students were told the test would measure a problem-solving task. Blacks and whites performed identically in the latter condition, but blacks did more poorly when they were told the test measured intelligence. In other words, blacks may unconsciously hold the same stereotypes as whites and behave accordingly. More alarmingly, experimental research shows that police officers, both white and black, are more likely to shoot at black suspects than at white suspects. There is a way out of the unconscious attitude behind. Consciously resist the stereotype. Research across a range of disciplines converges on the same result. Lessen the power of the stereotype by bringing it out of the unconscious dark and into, the con into the conscious light. Thus the Willie Horton ad lost much of, his, much of its effectiveness when Jesse Jackson made a public issue of its malicious intent. Social psychologists find that whites who harbor unconscious stereotypes are able to overcome their influence when they are made aware of them and they have sufficient time to process those mental images. Thus, medical researchers who do brain scan imaging find that the fear centers of the limbic system, what we call the lizard brain, are stimulated even among unprejudiced whites when the stimulus is brief, 30 milliseconds of a black face. Lengthen the stimulus to half a second, and the power of that stereotype is resisted by the conscious prefrontal cortex. This, this explains in part why police officers who have little time to react are more likely to be influenced by unconscious attitudes. On the issue of hip-hop music, we know that Don Imus did not coin the phrase he used to describe the Rutgers women's basketball team. It is also clear that he would have not used that phrase had he thought about it for a second or two. That image was planted in his mind through a complex sequence of events that began in a culture of poverty that thrives in the black ghettos of America. Hip-hop is a musical expression of a segment of African Americans who grew up under conditions of privation. The daily lives of African Americans have inspired a range of musical innovation and artistic expression, jazz, the blues. Sadness and tragedy are common to the human condition but in the United States they have been disproportionately experienced by African Americans who have developed musical forms to give artistic expression to their lived experience. The music industry is always on the hunt for innovative forms of music that may be marketed and sold to the largest audiences. Hip-hop has for over 25 years been an immensely popular genre of music. And its largest audience is white. Marketing to that audience follows the path of least resistance. Sensational images of sex and violence are easier to package and promote than more thoughtful and critical messages. Thus, gangster rap has enjoyed much more commercial success than the more politically oriented conscious rap. DJs use a mix of hip hop to manage the mood of a club, but gangster rap is catnip to an audience more interested in sexual release than raising political consciousness. So therein lie the incentives to artists, promoters, industry executives, and white consumers. The music industry offers one of the few paths out of poverty available to African Americans. <laughs> Sex and violence offer proven paths to commercial success, and black experience continues to provide vicarious thrills for white audiences. Today's suburban adolescents will in time move to influential positions within corporate America. The question this panel needs to address is whether the stream of imagery and language in gangster rap is more likely to get Lakeisha and Jamal a callback. And if the answer is no, how can the system of incentives be changed to make that more likely? Thank you. On behalf of the Women's Coalition on Dignity and Diversity, representing more than 11 million women and their families, we thank you for holding this hearing. Even though many of the members of Congress could not be here, many of the cameras have left, many people have left. We women have heard that someone said, We'll get over this and they'll just outweigh us. They don't know us because we're still here, we're still standing. Our coalition is made up of a diverse group of women who come from the National Council of Women's Organizations, National Council of Negro Women, the Women of Rainbow Push, the Women of National Action Network, National Organization for Women, Feminist Majority, YWCA, the National Coalition on Black Civic Participation, the National Congress of Black Women, women from labor, women in sports, women from religion, women from business and all walks of life. And I just want to say that this is not about hip hop. It's not about just rap for us. We are here 
because we are putting everybody on notice that women are tired of the images of ourselves that we see out there. Some of us educate ourselves. You'll notice at this table, everybody's name carries with it, doctor. And we work very hard for the young people in our community. And we're tired of being denigrated in our society. Mr. Chairman, we women, especially black women and our children, have been bombarded with misogyny, violence, and obscenity day after day. In a society that claims that it is fair and seeks justice for all, too many corporate leaders have captured the rawness of the feelings of many black males and a few black females who feel disenfranchised. Some rap and hip-hop music which began with a positive purpose now taps into the psyche of black teens who have a sense that no one cares that the young black males are routinely getting the short end of the stick in America. They look at what is happening in Katrina still, what is happening in the Gina Six in my home state of Louisiana, and they have reason to believe that they should be angry with everybody, including you and me, Mr. Chairman. Instead of putting adequate funds into the education and care of young people and the assurance of jobs and a chance to build their own businesses, our system has failed them by steadily diverting funds into war and destruction. We've not always provided the kinds of options that would prevent our young people from idolizing the lives of thugs and pimps and warlords and negative images. Too many of us have criticized young people for denigrating and disrespecting women and black people in order to make a living when they are offered no decent options. We have allowed greed to lead many of our young people to believe that it's okay to entertain themselves by destroying the culture of a people. We know all too well what happened to our Native American brothers and sisters in movies through the years. The, the obscenity we see and hear today have become commonplace to the point that it's being genocidal. Even on our very babies who have been subjected to horrifying language and images on public airways by those who should know better, but are claiming that this is the only way to relate to our children. If you haven't seen the so-called public service advertisement that looks just like any other cartoon called Read a Book, you need to see it to understand what we're talking about and why we are still standing. What are teachers to do when they hear the children repeat these words? Why should our children be assaulted daily with garbage under the guise of First Amendment rights that say nothing about responsibility? I challenge those who are so supportive of unlimited free speech without responsibility to question why they have not spoken out for the right of Anton Muhammad to testify here today and to speak out for independent media outlets. The corporate executives that lure our young people into believing it is all right to destroy the culture of people seem to have targeted black women and our families who contributed so much to this society. We believe in freedom of speech, but with every right goes a responsibility. We have a right to earn money but we have a corresponding responsibility to pay taxes. We have a right to travel on public transportation, but a responsibility not to carry guns unto them. We have a right to have children, but a responsibility not to abuse and neglect them. Mr. Chairman, using the public airways and public forums may be a right, but the line must be drawn and balanced by the responsibility to refrain from painting an immoral image of an entire race of people and of black women in particular. Not only entertainment executives, but advertisers must act more responsibly. Why should we want to buy products that pay for our destruction? Mr. Chairman, those of us who use public airways must be made to understand that there are consequences for those who insist upon subjecting our children to songs like read a book, and the words are just too bizarre for me to mention here today. When you see the video and hear the words, you will understand why we are so highly disturbed. Along with the right of freedom of speech goes the responsibility not to bombard those airways and our public forums with filthy, derogatory, offensive, indecent language that crosses the line of decency. We're not objecting to what goes on in a adult nightclub here. We're talking about what is brought to our children, and they deserve better images. Nearly 15 years ago, my predecessor, the late Dr. C. Dolores Tucker, warned us about where we were headed when we allow unrestricted rights to spew vicious, hateful words about women 
and how this contributes to violence and disrespect in our society. And I know, Mr. Chairman, you would agree the results have come to pass. On occasion, we turn on our television and we black women are embarrassed and humiliated by what we see when we see women who are portrayed as gangsters and men who are portrayed as pimps and women as prostitutes and the thuggishness that we see there with no mention of the great works of great black people, no balance whatsoever. What we are often seeing on television, videos, and elsewhere is not the culture of the black people I know. Our culture has more to do with respecting our elders, our sisters, our mothers, our grandmothers. But where are those images? In our culture, the gangster is the exception. The thugs, the pimp, the prostitute, those are the exceptions. Many black men and women serve this country with honor and distinction and deserve better treatment. In conclusion, I'd like to say, black women have served this country as Surgeon General, Secretary of Labor, Energy, Housing, Urban Development, Secretary of State, in Congress, as diplomats, as college presidents, in law, medicine, in all walks of life, and rarely do we ever hear public officials even speaking out about balancing rights with responsibilities when it comes to the images portrayed of black women in our families. Don Imus was wrong when he belittled the young women at Rutgers. Cortland Malloy of the Washington Post is usually right on the issues, but he just plain got it wrong when he belittled our efforts to demand better images of women in our families in our Enough is Enough campaign. I hear Robin uh, Thomas, Thomas has mentioned before, it's wrong when he says that it's highly offensive for a white male to call a black female the B word. Well, it's wrong then, but it's always wrong. Mr. Chairman, we in the Women's Coalition for Dignity and Diversity respect the First Amendment and we believe in the right to free speech, but we also believe in decent speech. Yes, rights without responsibility should be labeled anarchy, yet that is much of what we see and hear on our public airwaves and in public forums. It's time for Congress to stand up and to insist upon responsibility and to insist that others take responsibility and make that clear to the FCC and the FTC what their roles should be in making it happen. We can't and we won't sit around and wait for gangster rap or hip hop or anything else in our society with those vicious media images of us to self-destruct. We're not just talking about BET here either and its parent company, Viacom, about bombarding our community with vicious images. We're talking about everyone who does it in all walks of life, being credited with or blamed for the diminishing sales of gangster rap, Mr. Chairman, and offensive language and images is a banner we women proudly bear. But it's not happening because we allowed it to self-destruct. It's happening because we've been intent upon making it happen for years, at least since the National Congress of Black Women began this campaign nearly 15 years ago. Again, Mr. Chairman, we thank you so much for having this hearing today. We women are glad that we finally have our chance to say something public because we witnessed so much time when we were never called upon. So we appreciate you for calling on us today. Thank you very much. Dr. Figo, the diaco. Actually, I am the only person up here without a PhD. <laughs> so, you're good.